So this talk really comes out of an interest in seeing how archaeology might help us understand ancient literature, not simply as pretty pictures to illustrate the texts, but um, to help us unlock the meaning of text and an understanding of the culture behind them. Um, and um, that includes questions like how widespread was the appreciation of the highbrow Latin literature, Greek literature that um, is set on course syllabuses today, who read that? Um, how widespread was the appreciation of classical poetry across the Roman world? Um, we've got lots of papyri from Egypt, which give us an insight into that. But what about education and literature uh, culture elsewhere? So this talk is really about trying to reconstruct something of the literary culture from Roman North Africa from inscriptions. Um, and not just using the texts of the inscriptions, but what can we get from the materiality and the appearance of these things? And I suppose it's that the medium is the message kind of element of this talk, which justifies an inclusion in a seminar on multimodal communication. Um, what I show you here is the famous so-called Virgil mosaic from modern Seuss, ancient Hadramatum, port city in Tunisia. We see the poet seated, um, flanked by the muses, Cleo and Melpomene, um, who are the muses invoked in the opening lines of the Aeneid, the text of which is on the scroll in his hand. Um, now, clearly, um, any uh, if we if we enlarge the writing and turn it upside down, we can see Musa maybe um, here the opening um, lines of the. In the Aeneid, Musa mihi causas memora quo numine liso quadrat muse, tell me the, the reasons why um, the injured divinity, you know, and so on, and she got angry. Um, so any educated Roman after um, the middle of the Augustan period would have recognized these, these lines. And since the mosaic was on the floor, they wouldn't have had to turn the thing upside down. They just walked around and stood more or less where Virgil's head was to read it. Um, but can we go beyond the fact that somebody in one of the larger port cities of Roman North Africa put on their floor an image of the most famous Roman poet? Well, the provinces of Roman North Africa, essentially what's today northern Algeria, Tunisia and northern Libya, produced a very long list of eminent writers in antiquity. Those include the Republican playwright Terence, Terentius Maurus, Terence the Moor, um, the grammarian, rhetorician, and tutor of emperors, Marcus Cornelius Fronto, was from Serta, modern Constantine, um, which is round about here, not shown on the um, map. Um, and Fronto was of Berber origin. He describes himself as a Libyan of the nomadic Libyans. The novelist Apuleius um, was from North Africa, so were the early Christian writers Tertullian, Lactantius, Minucius, Felix. Uh, and St. Cyprian. And you want me, you want me to be in the online. Not that it's but we're seeing the table very yeah. well, but not you. you okay. Fine. Okay, multimodal. Um, um, the historian Aurelius Victor was from North Africa, so was St. Augustine and Hippo. Um, under Vandal rule, Victor of Vita and Forgentius of Ruspe, also North Africans. Um, in the fifth century, the grammarian Priscian, uh, Martianus Capella, described by Barry Baldwin in his article on some pleasures of later Roman literature, the African contribution as an intolerable windbag. Um, <clears throat> and in the sixth century, the poet Charippus wrote an epic poem, the Johannidos, about the reconquest of parts of Africa for the Byzantines from the Moorish tribes who'd invaded from the, the Northern Sahara. So throughout the Roman and even the Vandal and Byzantine occupation of North Africa, it produced quite a lot of eminent writers. Barry Baldwin in his article on North African literature also notes that there are more verse inscriptions from Africa than any other province, some 300 have so far been published. And many of these are funerary epitaphs. Um, and there's the usual predominance of second rate poetry and trite formulae inherent in such a genre. And a particular difficulty with North African poetry is that the North African dialect made no distinction between long and short vowels. Now, as many of you may know, um, Latin poetry relies on vowel quantity and rhythm, not on rhyme. So if a dialect is making no real distinction between 
long and short vowels, so if, if you can say either bath or bath, um, then um, that is a problem for um, vowel-based, um, length-based um, poetry. Um, epigrams, in fact, in the Latin anthology ridicule Berbers for trying to write verse for this particular region, uh, reason. And at Boon Gem, um, a severe and frontier fort in the Northern Sahara, a centurion commemorated um, in the early third century AD his construction of a bath building with an inscription in uh, a meter known as iambic scenarii, um, the initial letters of which formed an acrostic of his name, Quintus Avidius Quintinianus. A generation later in the late 220s, another centurion, Marcus Porcius Yasakthan, um, tried to match him with a poem about his reconstruction of the South Gate. And Jim Adams, in a study of that poem, um, in, in fact, of the two uh, uh, poets of Boonjem, um, notes that not a single line of Yasakthan's poem actually scans correctly. And he says, the Latinity of the poem of Avidius is a mixture of the literary and the substandard. Yet it does contain arresting phrases that well capture how welcome the bathhouse must have been to the soldiers of the Third Legion stationed here in the Northern Sahara um, in the AD 220s um, when the poem was carved. And this is um, uh, extract number one on your handout. There are handouts down the far end there. Um, he says, et punctus dedi, and I've given to all veras salutis lymphas tantis ignibus, inistis semper herenarchis colibus, nutantis austri solis flamos fervidas, tranquille nando delinerum corpora. I've given to all the true waters of health amid such fires in these always sandy hills of the south wind which makes shimmer the fiery flames of the sun so that they might soothe their bodies by peacefully swimming. Now verse building inscriptions like this and some verse epitaphs on Morselia are site-specific texts that require something of an appreciation of the building or maybe the landscape um, in which they were inscribed as, as here at Boon Gem. But um, for the bulk of this talk, I want to focus on what people are perhaps pleased to call the materiality um, of some inscriptions and what their visual appearance and particularly their script adds to the words of the text. And it's that um, which really justifies the inclusion, if anything justifies the inclusion of this talk in a multimodal communication seminar. Um, so most public inscriptions in the Roman world, um, and North Africa is no exception here, are in um, lapidary uh, capitals or rustic capitals, like these examples. So largely angular, except of course for the O's, um, uh, you know, fairly straight strokes, bold um, uh, lapidary stone cutting uh, capitals, or what's called African rustic capitals, which have serifs and little flourishes on the, um, the ends of the letters. Um, so that's the kind of norm for big public inscriptions, including inscriptions on uh, buildings to say who's built them and often how much they've spent, and on statue bases put up to uh, leading citizens of the town by the city, precisely because they'd spent so much on, on buildings or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and that's also the norm for funerary epitaphs. Um, um, but I'm gonna look at some exceptions, such as this one, the, Funerary epitaph of the so-called Maktar Harvester, and this is number two on your handout. Um, this is one of the most famous rags to riches stories from the Roman world. Found at Maktar, or ancient Maktaris, um, that's now in modern Tunisia. It was taken to the Louvre in 1886, um, where I think it now languishes in storage. But you can find some reasonable photographs of it on the web, a couple of which I show here. So the steely or slab, the grave marker, has a blank and rough worked lower part um, down, um, if I show you, no, this isn't, whoops. Um, I can't gesture with my hands to show the people on the screen. Um, anyway, the, the lower part of the steely is clearly rough work where it was set in the uh, ground. And at the top, you can just about make out parts of um, two names written in two columns, Kaiselia Namina Pia, and something Lianus, maybe Aurelianus, Rutilianus, Julianus uh, Pius. In both cases, the number of years they lived there, their ages would have been inscribed but are now lost. They were presumably husband and wife, um, and the husbands would have been the subject of the poem 
which takes up the bulk of the stele. Two further names, Gaius Morcaeus Maximus and Sextus Aurelius something, who lived 30 and 40 years respectively, um, are uh, inscribed on the sides of the stone, not shown here. Now, a poem of 28 lines in elegiac couplets occupies most of the front of the stele. The first two lines are largely illegible, but as you can see, particularly from the black and white image, the text overruns substantially a frame originally marked out around a central blank field for an inscription. Um, <clears throat> um, unusually, the inscription itself is not in either rustic capitals or lapidary ca capitals of the kinds we've just been looking at, but in what is known as an uncial script, uh, a curved rounded script imitating that of uh, manuscripts. Um, the word originally means inch high and it's thought to be from, um, or it's thought by some to be uh, from the um, ruling lines spaced an inch apart on large elaborate manuscripts. Um, but the kind of curved strokes are very much the sorts of ink pen strokes that you get on vellum parchment manuscripts, not um, the uh, much straighter um, lines that were used on more scratchy papyrus um, and which also um, uh, are easier to carve on, on stone. Um, I'm gonna to return to the point about the unsealed script shortly. But the poem tells the story of a man born into a poor rural family who worked as a harvester for 12 years before becoming a harvest gang master, um, leading the teams of reapers in the rich African wheat fields around Serta of the Numidians, modern um, El Kef, um, for a further 11 years. And by that time, the poem says he'd made sufficient money, presumably the gangs hired themselves out to the major villa landowners at harvest time, that he was able to afford the entry fee to the town council of Maktar. You had to pay to hold political office in, in the in the Roman world. And he then even became censor, a major figure on the city council. Now the poem stands out among the verse inscriptions of North Africa, not only for um, the unusual story of social mobility, but also because it doesn't entirely lack literary merit. There's vivid imagery, not only of the harvester leading the gangs through the fields, cutting and tying the bundles of wheat as he went. They mess all cunctis ante ibam primus in arvis post tergus linquens denser meum gremia. As reaper, I would go first before them all in the fields, leaving the thick sheaves behind my ear back, but also arresting phrases like this one here that conjure up the effort of physical work under the hot North African sun. Beast senas meses rabidos sub sole tatondi doctor et hex opere postea factus heran. Twice six harvests I reaped under the raging sun, and afterwards, because of my work, I was made a gang master. And there's a nice pun even on manus, which can mean hand, or a band, a group of men, um, in, in line 16. Undicim et turmas mesorum duximus annis et numidii campos nostra manus sequit. We led the gangs of harvesters for 11 years, and our hand, or our band, um, cut down the fields of Numidia. Now, strikingly, as I've said, that the text on the front of the stele is in this rounded uncial script, not in the usual lepidary or rustic um, capitals that are generally used for Latin inscriptions. Um, the word uncial for a script is first used in the early fourth century by Saint Jerome, um, and seems, as I've said, to mean letters an inch high in fancy manuscripts. And attention is generally focused on what this might mean for the dating. Um, a date in the later third century, the 260s or the 270s, is widely accepted on grounds that seem pretty unclear to me. Um, that date seems to have been proposed by the French scholar Gilbert Charles Picard on the basis of a similarity with the so-called stele of Beckert, which I'll come back to later, um, and which itself is dated on very shaky grounds. Brent Shaw, in his 2013 book, Bringing in the Sheaves, even suggests that in fact the inscription might belong to the fourth century, um, because of this cursive unseal script. And Jonathan Edmondson in the fairly recently published um, Oxford Handbook of Roman Epigraphy says, in North Africa during the later third century, a rounded form of lettering known as unseal or semi-unseal script developed, and this spread elsewhere during the fourth and fifth centuries. With its distinctively rounded letters, it was developed from cursive script used for writing on papyrus. It was used for epitaphs and also some 
monumental texts such as the statue boast of the senator Publius Flavius Pudens, Pomponianus Signo Vacontius from Timgat. It also appears on the famous Mactar Harvester inscription from Mactaris, and this has led to a reopening of the question of the date of this text. Formerly attributed to the third century, it may now belong to the mid or later fourth century or even later. Now, Brent Shaw's argument is based as much as anything else on paleography, and so I think is Jonathan Edmondson's, um, and on parallels with manuscripts like this one shown on the right here, in which unsealed scripts appear. This is a very high-end purple dyed manuscript with silver ink um, of the, of the um, Gospels. Uh, the page shown shows Matthew 14. Um, I'm going to argue for a rather different date and for a very different a very different significance in the use of unseal script both here and in other inscriptions that seems to have eluded most commentators on the Maktar harvester and indeed the other unseal inscriptions of North Africa. The exception is um, Lisa Fentress whose article from 1984 on frontier culture and politics at Timgad was an important inspiration for this talk um, as was a visit to Timgad with her and others in 2013. So indeed, the most important evidence comes from Timgad, Roman city in Algeria, where a group of inscriptions that employ unsealed letters repeal, reveal important things about connections between a tight circle of the city's elite and their self-presentation. We see here the forum um, looking southwest with part of the basilica the law courts in the foreground um, uh, at the right, and a series of inscribed statue bases around the edge of the paved piazza in front of the colonnades. And among this group on the western side um, are a pair of statue bases um, to a couple of chaps who are referred to as Vacontius and Potamius. Um, now you have to imagine these inscribed bases with a full length portrait statue of somebody wearing a toga um, on top of each one, not some column base like the one that's been plonked on top um, of the uh, base um, near the right hand side of the image, um, Potamius's base. Um, this has been uh, put on top of it after excavation in the late 19th century. Now, these inscriptions, as those sitting near the front might be able to make out, are in unsealed letters, but it's a bit clearer um, if we look at the Vacontius inscription here. Um, so, this inscription is um, elegantly carved in unsealed letters. The dedication is a very contrived effort in which the town council struggled to match the rhetoric for which their honor and was clearly famous. He was bilingual in Latin and Greek. This is number three on your handout. Um, and it translates as, to Vacontius, Publius Flavius Pudens Pomponianus, senator, a generous <laughs> benefactor towards his citizens in his hometown, who's exercised military offices, who ennobles letters that, sp uh, that speak letters in, in many places, who unites Attic fluency with Roman splendor, the council dwelling around the spring, Ordo Incola Fontis, dedicated this to their patron of rich and flowing mouth, Patrona Aurus Uberis et Fluentis, Nostro Altari Fonti, a second spring. Um, so it's a very contrived metaphor um, that uh, tries to link the city council to him. Vacontis's real and full name was Publius Flavius Pudens Pomponianus, and Vacontius is a signum or a kind of nickname. Um, Signa like this seem to have come into fashion in the Severum period, the early third century AD, in response to the proliferation of the elite's full names, but beyond the normal three names, the tria nomina of the Republican and early imperial period. So when people had four or even five names, it became a bit of a mouthful, and it was easier to refer to them by a single nickname, but nickname doesn't quite really carry the right connotations in English uh, for these signa though. They aren't pejorative or insulting or diminutive or over familiar. Rather, they're carefully chosen to convey some kind of sophistication. Um, and many as we shall see are Greek, um, though Vacontius isn't. The Vaconti were in fact a tribe of Southern Gaul, and I'll come back in a moment as to why Pomponianus might have chosen Vacontius as his signal. But the metaphor which casts Vacontius as a fount of oratory, a second spring, is chosen so that the council can equate themselves in some sense with Vacontius, as well as around the spring, order incula fontis, um, and Vacontius as a fluent spring of rhetoric. And the spring in question is surely the 
Aqua Septimiana Felix, um, which is over on the uh, left hand side of this image, um, enclosed within the later Byzantine fort, whose walls and towers um, you can see towards the left hand side. Um, um, it's a short, it's a spring sanctuary, short distance outside the south gate of the original city. Um, and it was monumentalized or redeveloped in 213, 214, um, and renamed the Aqua Septimiana Felix in honor of the ruling emperor Septimius Severus. The monumentalization included surrounding it with bronze railings, a portico and a viridarium, that's a, a lush garden. We know all this from the yeah. inscription that mentions these, these things, together with paintings and other buildings and a colonnaded street led from it um, to the uh, south baths, just outside the south gate of the city. The spring discharged into a pool that you see here, top right, um, later included as a water source within the, the Byzantine fort that was built here after the recapture of the region from the moors of the Ores Mountains under Justinian in the uh, 530s. The connection between Vicontius and the Aqua Septimianus Felix is confirmed, if that were needed, by the fact that Vicontius dedicated the statue of Deo Patria, the, the a goddess of his home city, um, to Caracalla, Septimius Severus' successor as emperor, um, and his mother, Julia Domna, uh, Mater Castorum, mother of the camps of, of, the, of the legions. Um, so that's um, visible uh, around the center of the inscription. Um, you may just be able to make out Castorum here. Um, this is number four on the, the handout. The inscription is on a short cylindrical pillar surmounted by an octagonal statue base, um, and it's now lying um, within the Byzantine fort near one end of the pool. Now, the text this time is in normal capitals. Um, we have uh, Publius Flavius Pudens Pomponianus's full name just below the center of the inscription, but without the signum Vicontius. And crucially, the imperial titulature for Caracalla gives us a date between the 10th of September 214 and the 9th of December 215. That's just after the monumentalization of the Spring Sanctuary in 213-214. So here, therefore, the reference to him as a fons, a spring in the dedication by the Ordo Incola Fontis, the council dwelling around the spring, um, that, that makes sense. The statue base in the forum is part of a dialogue between Vicontius and the city. Statue honors put up to him by the city in return for gifts, buildings or monumentalization of the spring sanctuary or whatever that he has given to the city. Um, and so it, the, um, the statue put up to him in the forum should be seen as a direct response to Vocontius's dedication of a statue of the Dea Patria of the spring. And this therefore puts the statue base in the forum with its uncial inscription and its signum in the reign of Caracalla around the same period, 215 or perhaps the following year, 260. This is crucial for the dating of uncial inscriptions. Also in the Spring Sanctuary and also now within the Byzantine fort, the same Publius Flavius Pudens Pomponianus dedicated a dens or a tooth um, to the city on an inscribed hexagonal base, handout number five, in fulfillment of a vow made by his mother. Now, if he's dedicating a tooth, it wasn't one of his milk teeth. Um, it was probably an elephant tusk, um, in fact, since elephants weren't fully hunted to extinction in North Africa to supply the amphitheaters of the Roman world until sometime in the fourth century. The damaged top of the base, you see on the left-hand side, actually still preserves part of the curved socket in which the tusk would have been mounted um, horizontally. And that will be an apt dedication in the sanctuary of Dea Patria, the goddess of Africa, who's usually represented in art with an elephant headdress and tusks. Vicontius appears one more time on the right hand side here in an inscription also in Uncils um, on an octagonal statue base from the South Barnes at Timgat. Um, um, this is handout number six. Uh, the Barnes have been enlarged earlier in the Severan period in 198. Um, and this inscription is set up by Vicontius to the city, handout number six. It gives his career in reverse order. 
He was first quaestor of the province of Sicily, then he was tribune of the people at Rome. He was praetor, curator, that's in charge of the town's financial affairs uh, of the town of Alba Fucens in Italy, then prefect in charge of the corn dole at Rome, imperial legate, governor for the province of Aquitaine, southern France, um, and finally proconsul or governor of Crete and Cyrenaica. And in that latter role in the Greek speaking east of the empire, his fluency in Attic Greek, which the Senate, uh, which, which the town council's inscription to him praises, must have been a benefit. Now, significantly, this inscription set up by the Contius too is in unsealed letters, um, a fact that's generally overlooked because no photograph of it has been published. Um, this is my own from 2013. But already in 1887, Franz Buchala had suggested that our Flavius Pudens Pomponianus was probably the same person as the grammarian Flavius Pomponianus, who cited by a later third century grammarian, Julius Romanus, in a passage that's preserved only in the writings of another grammarian, the fourth century Carisius. So this is a grammarian's grammarian, if you like. Um, Buchala's suggestion was made only on the basis of uh, knowledge of the first inscription, the statue base in the forum set up to Vacontius. But the fact that Vacontius himself also set up an inscription statue base in the South Baths in Unseals um, supports the identification. The use of Unseals in both the inscription to Vacontius and the inscription by Vacontius is a deliberate and a highly significant choice. We're not dealing with some late degenerate fourth or fifth century stone cutter um, who has no practice in carving monumental inscriptions and knows only a script like handwriting. Quite the reverse. The curved flowing lines of unseal letters are harder to cut than straight line capitals. And in both inscriptions, the carving is very high quality. The choice of unseals is a conscious affectation. Um, it's redolent of learning and literary culture. It deliberately imitates manuscripts on stone. So Vacontius is advertising his literary sophistication alongside his senatorial career by having the statue base he dedicated in the South Baths carved in unsealed letters. And the town council is paying him an additional compliment by having their dedication carved in the same script. But if we can now accept Vacontius as a self-consciously learned grammarian as well as a senatorial proconsul and governor, we may have a clue that offers a possible explanation of his signum the Viconti were a tribe of Alpine Gaul, and I suppose it's possible that Vacontius could simply trace his ancestry back to somebody who originally came from there. But whether or not he could, I wonder if the signum might be an intentional reference to Pompeius Trogus, the historian and polymath of the first century BC, near contemporary of the historian Livy, who was a Vacontian. Um, Pompeius wrote extensively on um, the Natural History of Plants and Animals, works now lost, but which are cited by Pliny the Elder, and a 44-volume um, Historiae Philippicae et Totius Mundi Origines et Terrae Citus, Philippic Histories and Origins of the Whole World and Places of the Earth, preserved only in excerpts and in a partial summary by the later historian Justin. Be that as it may, Vacontius wasn't the only notable of Timgad to be honored using his signum or in unseal letters. Next door, but on um, but one to the base of Vacontius' statue in the forum is another statue base, handout number seven, the one that they erroneously put the uh, column base back on top of, um, honoring one Patanius, a boy or puer of senatorial rank, whose real name was Gaius Pontius Ulpius Verus, something Nianus, part of its lost, Victor. Potemius' father was flame and perpetuous, that's priest for life of the imperial cult at Timgad, apparently, and of equestrian rank, that's the next level down below senator, but you still had to be worth 400,000 sesterces, which is a lot of money. Presumably, Potemius' father, who wasn't a senator, but his son was, had bought his son into the senate. He had to be worth a million sesterces to be a senator. The dedicator who actually put the statue up to the senatorial boy Potamius, uh, one Quintus Harmonius Donatius, was Potamius's client or social inferior. Um, and the other inscription on handout eight, which reads for Contio um, is also in unseals. I think probably um, it's this plinth uh, that's been put on top of the Vacontius base, and Potamio must be carved around the other side. But, 
um, it appears that um, when I photographed it, um, I was too focused on the Bacontio front and I didn't take a photo of the, of the back. But assuming that that inscription is correctly published in CIL, CIL is the big corpus of Latin inscriptions started in the, the 19th century. Um, assuming that's correctly published, um, it links the two people, they are contemporary. Um, and Plotamius therefore also dates sometime around the reign of Caracalla, around about 215. And his signum is clearly derived from the Greek potamos, meaning river. So Vacontius was a spring, Potamius was a river. Now, another text from the forum, um, this is um, handout number nine on the um, uh, side of the entrance stairs, um, is a statue base, another statue now lost, also inscribed in uncial uh, letters, dedicated by the town council to the equestrian Marcus Virius Flavius Jugurtha, who was also flame and perpetuous, priest for life of the town cult, uh, of, of the imperial cult, and the town councillor of Carthage. Um, and he was appointed as curator of Timgad to oversee civic finances. The fact that he's described as tantum deserto quantum bono, as eloquent as he is good, also gives particular force to the choice of unsealed letters again. Um, his learning, eloquence and sophistication are emphasized both in the text and by the materiality of the statue base. Um, and as Lisa Fentress has pointed out, Jugurtha may in fact be a signal. He's a true North African. Jugurtha, of course, was the famous North African leader against Rome um, in the first century BC, uh, late, late second century. Um, a base to his daughter, Viria Flavia Severiana, um, and that's number 10 on the handout, it's found in 1909 on the, in the Byzantine fort and is presumed to have come from the forum, although the subsequent um, discovery of the Aqua Septimiana Felix Sanctuary within the area of the fort might actually lead us to wonder if it too was set up there like the various Vacontius inscriptions. It's not an exact pair to her husband's base in the forum since it's on a different stone, it's um, the blue lias rather than the kind of um, local sandstone. Um, but again, the use of uncial letters lends its similarity in form and intent. The first line, Valubi, dative of Valubis perhaps, also seems to be her signal. And her name, Severiana, would fit perfectly well with a reasonably early third century Severan dynasty date. From the South Baths, where we've seen that Vacontia set up a statue, comes our final uncial example from Timgat, uh, number 11 on the handout, a statue base set up by uh, an equestrian, the rank below senator, um, Lucius Valerius Tatianus, calling himself by the signum Panacreus. Um, it's set up to his patron, uh, Tiberius Julius Tertullus Antiochus, who went by the signum Antarchius. Now here, only the signum of the dedicator, Panacreus, down the bottom, is in Uncials. Um, Tiberius Julius Tertullus Antiochus must be a senator since his client is an equate in question. Um, Burley convincingly identifies him as the Tiberius Julius Antiochus, who was governor of Numidia in AD 242. The use of signa shows familiarity and friendship, and the same dedicator set up another inscription in very similar wording to a later governor of Numidia, Aurelius Cominius Cassianus, in 247. So this inscription probably dates to the 240s, or maybe even the 230s, if it was set up before Antarchius was governor. Now, given the literary pretensions of this elite group of Timgad's equestrian and senatorial citizens, it's perhaps unsurprising that they, also in the first part of the third century, another senator from the city, um, Marcus Julius Quintianus Flavius Regatianus, left a sum of 400,000 sesterti in his will to build the city a library. And here is the library with the, with the uh, dedicatory inscription um, recording the amount of sums. Um, and you see uh, in the brickwork of the internal parts of the library walls, the niches for bookcases um, uh, to hold the scrolls. Now, before we leave Timgad, I don't want to um, leave you with the impression that all of the city's elite participated in this um, somewhat show-off game of unsealed lettering on inscriptions. The unsealed texts remain very rare. 
and there are other prominent members of the city council, uh, more or less exactly contemporary, who used Cigna, but um, didn't set up dedications or were honored in dedications in uncial lettering. An example is Marcus Plotius Faustus, otherwise known by Cigna Certius and his wife Certia, who built a market and probably also the big Capitolian temple. The statue bases to them set up by each other or by their son Tantius are in the usual um, lapidary capitals seen over on this side or rustic capitals seen over on the um, left hand side, but they're not in Ansitz. Um, Lisa Fentress argues that Sirtius acceded to equestrian rank in part through making money from large scale building projects. He seems to have profited from the redevelopment of the western part of the city in the early third century. And his career background outside Timgad seems entirely military. He seems to have lacked the literary pretensions of someone like Pomponianus Pocontius. Elsewhere, we do sometimes um, find um, soldiers inscribing in Uncils um, to hand out 13 at Lambysis, um, the headquarters of the Third Legion only 15 miles from Timgad. Um, or we have, um, uh, so that's um, this one here, um, um, uh, Decimus Pius. Um, uh, so a funerary inscription um, in monumental capitals for a town councillor at Hadromatum, modern Seuss, was set up by his son, a centurion of the Third Legion, who then identifies himself in uncial script as a Decimus Pilus, a centurion of the 10th cohort of the Legion. There seems to be no particular literary point here, unlike the Timgad inscription we've just seen, but the late Jim Adams in his article on the poets of Boon Gem, details under number one on the handout, brings together the evidence for centurions and literary culture. An inscription from Sufez, modern Spiba in Tunisia, um, handout number 14, set up with public money to an emperor whose name has been deliberately erased, is also in Ansils. Um, um, Gustav Vilmans, who uh, collected the inscriptions in the late 19th century for CIL volume eight, remarks that it can hardly be later than the third century. And the use of the script at that date, he thought was um, surprising. He thought it was very early. Um, but in fact, it would fit with third century Severan inscriptions we just see. The reason here, though, for the use of Ansils in this case is not obvious. We don't have the full inscription and we don't even know the name of the emperor who was erased. So with that <coughs> in mind, we can now return to the cultural and social context of the Maktar harvester. The realization that the use of Ansils is a meaning laden choice and not merely a byproduct of a late date coupled with the secure dating of Vacontius at Timgad to the reign of Caracalla means that we don't have to necessarily regard this poem as being as late as the 260s and 270s, certainly not as late as the fourth century. I wouldn't entirely rule out the 260s or the 270s, the, um, uh, the demographic effects of the plague of Cyprian in the mid third century, a pandemic that may have been something like the Ebola virus, um, may well have led to problems filling seats on town councils and could have assisted the kind of social mobility attested by the inscription, but that sort of mobility was possible before anyway, and the, the dated parallels fit better in the first half of the third century. Why could the text of the Maxtile Harvester inscription not be severe? But more important, I think, than the date is the fact that the use of unsealed script again shows a conscious visual evocation of book hand, um, certainly at Timgad, and I think we can show this at Maktar too. Maktar has in fact produced a remarkable number of verse inscriptions, a total of 15, um, including the, the Harvester poem, dating from the second or third century right through to the sixth century. And those include a group of um, uh, four verse texts on the mausoleum of the Julii. Um, uh, um, clearly a family who wished to advertise their learning and um, literary pretensions. And the first of these commemorates a son who died at the age of 22, having shown great promise as an orator. Um, it says a boy strong in the intellect, well behaved as a teenager, as a young man, he was an orator, and in a toga, he delighted the ears of the public with his learning. It publicas aures togata studies delectabit suis. Now the poems on the outside of the mausoleum um, of the 
Julie are not in unsealed capitals, unseals would be very hard to read high up on a tall mausoleum built too, um, and lapidary capitals would be much easier, even if they were rubricated, painted red to make them um, easier to read, as I imagine the inscriptions originally were. In fact, Gustav Willmans, who prepared volume eight of CIL, the Corpus Inscriptionum Latinorum for North Africa, riding around uh, Northern Tunisia and Algeria on horseback in the 1870s with an armed escort, says of the inscriptions, um, and you see it uh, in the Latin commentary down at the bottom on the left-hand side, contuli telescopio usus, it's Latin for I checked it using a telescope. As an aside, Vilmans was an extraordinary, extraordinarily dedicated scholar. Um, my favorite comment of his on the source of a text is on a funerary inscription built into the repair of um, a ruined Roman bridge over the Magerda at Shemtu, where he says, de scripsiusque ad pectus in aqua stands. I copied it down standing up to my chest in, in water. <laughs> But the funerary inscriptions are, this is, this is actually the uh, bridge um, and the, um, the inscription, which he describes the square pectus and aqua stands. Um, so he had to wade out to copy the, the thing. But the funerary inscriptions inside the mausoleum of Julia at over the niches for cinerary urns are in unsealed scripts. And for two of them, CIL 8653 and 654, it's clear from CIL because Vilmans took squeezes that um, enabled their uh, reproduction um, in CIL in pseudo facsimile. Um, so you see them on the right hand side here. Um, <clears throat> but we actually learned from Ernst Hubner's book on Latin scripts that the other four inscriptions over the niches were also in similar letters. Now, given the general rarity of uncial inscriptions on stone, that fact is not random. And if any further proof were needed, it's another verse epitaph from Maktar. Um, inscribed like that of the Maktar harvester in unseals. It's the so-called Sippus of Beckett, number 16 on the handout, um, and it was found in 1953 in the cemetery of Ein Muzid on the outskirts of Maktar, near the Roman road linking Maktar to the nearby town of Uzapa. It wasn't published until 1970, and it's not really a Sippus or a Stele, but a funerary marker in the form of an altar. Inscribed on the front face with the funerary formula DMS, Dis Manibus Sacrum, Sacred to the Gods of the Departed. Um, then there's a poem of 10 lines of hexameters um, and the signum, Euthasia, down the bottom. Now, the deceased, Beckett, a woman, um, seems to have died at an age between 15 and 20. The poem's fairly standard, funerary epitaph stuff, but it isn't noteworthy for literary flair. But three points do stand out. First, the name Beckett, which is clearly not Latin, and it's perhaps of Punic or Libby Phoenician origin. Compare, for example, the Libby Phoenician uh, toponym Puput, um, a site on the coast of northern Tunisia. Um, the use of the Ancil script is noteworthy. And the third noteworthy point is the signum Euthasia at the end. Now, uh, Gilbert Charles Picard, in the publication of the text, thought that the signum, as he said, indique la pertenance à une communauté religieuse, indicates that, um, uh, that she belonged to a religious community, having argued fairly improbably that the fairly simple decoration of the altar um, and wreath and some kind of fruit or pine cone indicated that she was a bacchant, um, he went on to see the signum as belonging to a well-known category of mystic words, beginning with the adverb you, Greek for good, and invested it with an Isaic or a Bacchic significance. The fact there was no other evidence of such a cult at Maktar was easily disposed of, he said. Mais becote d'autre part la seule Maktaras apporte un signum. But uh, Beckett was the only woman from Maktar to uh, carry uh, a signum. The sect which had imposed it on her um, could perhaps only have been very sparsely represented in the town. The young woman could even been initiated in, in another city, he said. Um, all this, of course, is sheer fantasy. Um, Signa were often formed of or calced on Greek words. Euthasia would mean of good disposition or well put together, and it would be a perfectly explicable signum for a young woman. There's certainly no need to see any Isaic or Bacchic connotation. 
Um, and a verse inscription in Unseals with a signum is making a point about the, the deceased's sophistication and literary culture, and by extension, her family's sophistication and literary culture. So to sum up, our other main group of Unseal inscriptions beside those from Tim Gav is from Maktar, and these are all at Maktar linked together by being either in verse, a uh, Beckett and the Maktar harvester, or inside a mausoleum that's conspicuous for having several verse inscriptions on the outside. The use of Unseals is not a reflection of a late antique date, but it's a deliberate affectation advertising education, culture, sophistication. The Maktar Harvester hasn't merely had an extraordinary career from humble reaper through gangmaster to city councillor and censor. He wished to be remembered not merely as successful and rich, but also as cultured and sophisticated. Hence the commissioning, for I doubt he wrote the poem himself, of a striking epitaph in verse, um, and hence the unusual but not wholly unique to have it inscribed in uncial letters. The date needn't at all be as late as the 260s or 270s, so I couldn't entirely rule that out, but I think it fits much better sometime in the earlier third century, the Severan period, or at least between, say, 210 and the 240s. I think we perhaps learned one other thing too from this inquiry. These unsealed inscriptions allow us to recover a North African book hand of the early third century, fossilized in stone. Rather than date the inscriptions to the 4th or the late 3rd century, because their script looks similar to the 4th century manuscripts and one late 3rd century papyrus from Egypt, the inscriptions show that in North Africa, people were already writing in a well-developed unsealed script by the reign of Caracalla. Jonathan Edmondson's remarks in the Handbook of Latin Epigraphy, which I quoted earlier, in North Africa during the later 3rd century, a rounded form of lettering known as unseal or semi-unseal script developed and this spread out where during the fourth and fifth centuries, put that development around a century too late. The script had already developed by the early third century to the point where it made the jump to stone inscriptions. And we might confidently retroject its development in manuscripts back into the second century. So we have a glimpse therefore of the script used in North African parchment books long perished. Thank you.